Alice Pung, welcome to Booktopia. Thanks, Carol. Now, you open your book with a quote from Kurt Vonnegut who says, Life is nothing but high school. Is that how you feel? <laughs> is that how I feel? Um, so, my book, Lorinda, is about institutions, and we all encounter institutions. First one we encounter is schooling, but then you, you go to the workforce or you, you know, join a club or society. So life is all about institutions. I, I guess that's where that Kurt Vonnegut quote is coming from. What made you want to write this book? Growing up, I went to five different high schools. As an author, I visit hundreds more, you know, over seven years. And um, I'm fascinated by high schools because they, they form the individual, they form young adults. And when you see people, um, for example, at reunions, and you see how they've either changed from the trajectory you thought they would follow in high school or how they've remained the same, it really makes me realise life is nothing but high school. You're <laughs> fighting against your high school self or you're <laughs> you know, accepting that self you were. But I'm curious about the fact that you would even mention reunions because without wanting to be patronising in any way, you would yeah. be too young to be going to reunions. Oh, well, I, I did go to my 10-year high school reunion, so I'm 33 now. And what was it like? Um, because it, it was wonderful for me. I'd never stay too long at any particular high school, so that's why my book is about an outsider. I, the longest I stayed was two years, so going to this high school reunion so I finished up at a school and I went back. Uh, at the age of 27, everyone was a stranger to me, so I could meet them for the first time almost. Whereas you could see that among themselves, they'd been together since mm -hmm. kindergarten, so they weren't strangers to each other. And you could see how they locked each other in the selves they used to be. I'm interested about that because um, a clique, there's, a, there's a, a clique in your book, The Cabinet in Lorinda, uh -huh. and they are a um, very powerful group of girls, very persuasive, and they operate in a very interesting way. But I wonder whether you think that in fact um, mean girls and cool <laughs> girls are the same the world over. Is there a kind of universality to those tribal groupings and their behaviour? I think there is and I think high school is fascinating to me because they're especially pronounced. At no point in your life, as an adult, you find a lot of adults are quite comfortable with themselves and that's only because they get to choose their friends. They get to hang around who they want to be with. In high school you're forced to be around 200 people and you might be the, the funniest person at home um, in high school if no one finds you funny then your identity is shot through. You don't have that identity anymore. It's determined by other people. And what fascinated me while writing Lorinda is why we give certain groups um, of, of students, certain individuals power mm -hmm. that they don't deserve. Because a lot of high school students I've met don't really like the popular kids, but they're the ones contributing to their popularity. So you wouldn't have leaders without these followers. That's absolutely true. That's, I'd never thought about that before until I read Lorinda. You're absolutely right. You mentioned that you went to five different high schools. Why did you go to so many? So I grew up in the western suburbs of Melbourne um, and my father really believed in education. So he just kept finding me high schools he considered were better or more academic <laughs> than the last ones. And I enjoyed all of them. All of the high schools taught me something. Some were very competitive and some had cultures where they um, fostered kindness and generosity. And that was what really interested me when I started to write Lorinda, is not how you form an individual academically, but how you form their moral character in high schools. I grew up in Braverook where if your parents worked all the time, or some people um, were in households where they went to three generations of welfare so they'd never seen a working person. Um, among the Asians the parents would take on two or three jobs to send children to Catholic schools. So you were at home a lot of the time. No one was teaching you anything about how to be a person or live your life and you just got that at school. So we don't focus that much on moral education because it's considered wrong and considered um, 
you know, not the scope of your schooling, but for some kids it's pretty necessary. And what do you think Lorinda has to say, Alice, about the stereotype that we might have of the Asian kid as the SWAT who does better at school than anybody else? <laughs> oh, what does it have to say? Hmm. Well, the stereotype is born out of necessity. Sometimes it's not true. I grew up in a suburb where a lot of my friends um, weren't SWATs. They were quite happy to help their parents sew clothes at home and to um, you know, become uh, maybe may a legal secretary that was considered a good job to have, and they were supported by the community. So, not all Asian parents are tiger parents, <laughs> but if you really wanted to get out of the factory suburbs, university was the way to go. And if you wanted to get out of a certain class of life, which is essentially what the main character Lucy is aspiring to do. So who do, you, who do you think of as your reader? When you're writing a book like Lorinda, do you have a particular reader in mind? Not really. I, I think about a young person like myself when I was maybe 16 or 17, maybe 13 or 14. Um, and every high school I went to, I realised that my identity changed. In one high school I was extremely funny and well liked. Um, in another high school where I was one of the few Asian kids, suddenly I was the quiet Asian and in a very intense high school, a state selective high school, I was, you know, probably one of the worst students, <laughs> one of the less academically gifted students. Yeah, so your identity changes every school you go to. It's hard to imagine you being one of the worst <laughs> students. One of the things that I've really enjoyed about this book is the way you sort of skewer the kind of liberal, well-intentioned parents <laughs> of some of the girls in this story with their, um, their curiosity about your Asian culture. <laughs> and, uh, and immediately that, that turns into a cooking class where, <laughs> where they learn to make rice paper um, uh, rolls. So uh, did you have a lot of fun with that kind of slight, gentle satire on um, Australians who, who mean well but don't realise that they're putting their foot in it as they do so. <laughs> oh, Carol, I'm glad you mentioned that because that was one of my favourite parts of the book to write. And I'm glad you picked up on the satirical aspect of the book because I, I don't want teachers to get alarmed. A lot of teachers have looked at the cover and said, is this Lauriston College or is this MLC? Is, what school is this? <laughs> it's a satirical book. It's no such school. Um, but yeah, I, I would not be where I am without well-intentioned liberal teachers and friends and, you know, <laughs> parents of friends getting me through and teaching me about this different class in life. So was there one teacher who was your champion or who understood you or got you in a particular way and maybe encouraged you as a writer? Because so many writers say there is one teacher who maybe is the first person to read your work out aloud and validate you that way. Is there one that sticks out for you? Oh, there are so many teachers, but I had a wonderful year nine teacher named Mrs. Clark. She was from the, she was from the United States and she introduced us to John Marsden books and it was the first time I came across books that put teenagers at the centre of the world. This was before Hunger Games, this was before, you know, the dystopias, teenagers around the world, and he took them quite seriously. But more than that were his books dealing with mental illness in teenagers, um, which we could really, you know, identify with as 14-year-olds. Because you had a breakdown at one stage at school yourself, didn't you? I did. I How did. did you get yourself out of that? So when a young person has a nervous breakdown, people panic, people think it's the end of the world, you know, because your brain is sizzled and you find it hard to eat and sleep and do normal things. So my parents, who were the most well-intentioned parents and who didn't know very much about psychiatry, that there was one spectrum for my mother that was sane or insane. So there was no depression, there was no nervous breakdown, so she thought I'd gone the insanity street. So they took me to doctors and the doctors recommended a lot of pills for me. But I was in year 12 at that time and the pills blur your brain. So I really didn't want my brain to be sizzled like that. So I didn't take them and I just got through. I don't recommend it for all young adults to not take their pills, but I think I understood myself well enough to know that that was not good for me at that time. This book, in a way, is a letter that 
that Lucy, I'm going to call her Lucy because that's yeah. one of her names in the book, um, writes to herself, writes to her authentic original self, who uh -huh. has another name. If there was one piece of advice that you now, as a very poised woman of 33 and a very successful writer of 33, could give to your younger self aged, I don't know, 13 or 14, what would it be? I think it would be just to keep on keeping on. Life isn't always the carpet factories in Braybrook and life isn't just um, being stuck. Yeah. Alice Pine, thank you very much. Thanks, Caroline.